Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another Real Conversation. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome David Sale. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining me here in the studio. It's my uh, pleasure. Yeah, like I'm I'm looking at kind of your resume, <laughs> your resume, just so that I don't screw it up in terms of um, all the things that you've accomplished. But wow, man! I mean, if you could if you could see all the different components of the game, you've seen quite a bit. Uh, for those of you that don't know, you can see his resume from working. Uh, at GMO to, to what is called, all right, I call it TIF, but mm -hmm. uh, the um, chief investment officer there at the investment fund for foundations. So you've seen the, how the big money moves. You've seen you know, how the macro gurus you know, put, put it all together. It's, it's, it's cool, man. Uh, thank you for making the time. My pleasure. I feel like I'm the fourth Gump of investing. You know, I've been <laughs> on the sidelines observing, but we can talk about that. It's been a great privilege, but I'm happy to be here. Do you, yes, ever, you ever stop learning? No, that would make life interesting, right? Yeah, if we ever start. I, I do reflect from time to time, and particularly looking forward to this conversation with you about like how ignorant I was 5, 10, 15, and 20 years ago, you know, managing serious money. And I look back and think, oh, God, I can't believe, A, that people entrusted me with that much money, and B, how little I knew when I was deploying it. Mm. Oh, it only, and it's only 5 to 10, 15 years ago you say that. Yeah, I mean, the whole, you talk about this all the time, but the, the world has changed rather completely over the course of my career. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. I said that yeah. to Steiner, and, uh, you know, full disclosure, uh, and, you know, David spends time listening to us on, on the call or on the <laughs> Macro show, so. But this morning on the call, I said that to Steiner. I said, because I said, well, did we start working together back in 09? And he said, yeah. And, and like as Steiner is, there's brevity to the answer, but I had a it was a leading question. I said, yeah. like, how much has our job changed going back you know, 15 years? And he said, look, it's entirely changed. Yeah. It has entirely changed in important respects and changed not at all in the most important respect, mm -hmm. right? Which is what are the fundamental prerequisites for success, which we can get into. Well, let's do which it. Which is why I'm such a fan of Hedgeye. But, yeah, let's get into yeah. that because I mean, I, yeah. um, and 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 whether or not you feel that that applies to playing, you know, watching athletes play at the highest level or anything for that matter. Um, we can get into it, but I need to pop a question at you before we do, <laughs> right? which I telegraphed earlier today. It's the trust but verify question, right? yeah. which these days, particularly this day, with what went on in the Bahamas overnight. We're learning the importance of trusting but verifying. So how do you know for sure, how can you know for sure you had the lowest SAT score at Yale? Well, I, <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I have employed a Bayesian inference process. Mm -hmm. I try to collect with every incremental um, meetup with a former classmate or friends. I put it out there publicly, too, to make sure that anyone who yep. has, who does think Fair that they've enough. had a lowest SAT, lower SAT score than me puts up their hand and says, hey, look, dude, did you do worse than this number? I have never heard a number lower. Uh, I also have, uh, well, I have to be careful about who I know in, yeah. in uh, admissions. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I, I, I've had good indications that, I am, that I'm accurate in that statement. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought of it, and I popped the question at you this morning, because in my Forrest Gumpian travels through my career, I had the privilege earlier on of working directly with Jeremy Grantham, as I think you know. Yeah. And he's a phenomenal human being in almost every respect, really every respect. He's a great student of bubbles, which we can talk about. You've, mm -hmm. you've done a lot of great work on that. Um, and he's a great quant, and he's also just good in uh, other aspects of the industry. But when I joined the firm, and I said to Jeremy, he was already doing quant work, um, mostly just U.S. stock selection. And, and I said, look, if I'm going to be helping you, I need to know more of the inner workings of the model. I don't need to see the code, but I need to know more than I do today. Mm -hmm. And I said, so you have this three-factor model, value, momentum, and neglect. What's this neglect thing? And he looked at me and said, David, I want to encourage you to forget everything you learned at that fancy business school you went to. <laughs> and particularly, I want you to, you, you studied the capital asset pricing model where they tell you that the return on, the, on a stock long term is positively correlated with its beta. He said, just reverse the sign, right? And you'll do much better. That's our neglect factor. I hope I'm not breaching any confidence because they probably use it to still. I wrote it down extent. immediately. I hadn't heard that yeah, before. Yeah, <laughs> so just reverse the beta. I mean, this has already been played out in the course of the years since then, right? Because mm -hmm. you've had the bet against the beta models and the low beta stocks do better and all that stuff. But back in the day, this was really a proprietary insight. Why do I mention it with Keith McCullough, lowest SAT score? I said it this morning on Twitter. You know, maybe Yale ought to redo its admissions process and say, let's go for the people who've got real character, real ethics, particularly a work ethic, and the lowest score. Because <laughs> they'll be, 
because you've accomplished a lot. So um, I, I'm, I'm no sycophant, fan, but I wanted to make that point. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, especially yeah. coming from, for those of you that don't know, he's a Baker scholar you know, from Harvard oh, Business School. Don't judge uh, a book by its cover. I've worked, I, I, um, when I went to Carlisle, my last job working for somebody else, the only other person that I've seen Baker scholar on the piece of paper and I'm sitting across from him is a, a gentleman by the name of Hamayan Saleh. Uh, so he was a, a guy that I hired as essentially one of my, my top guys on my research team. And I, I mean, the, the, I just call it workhorse intellectual capacity. Like, you know, the, I have a tremendous amount of respect for that. I mean, I try to surround myself with the smartest people possible yeah. that, have, that have the ability to just generate that kind of, you know, that kind of work. Yeah. Because I know where to put it. Yeah. You know? I want to come back to that because we're going to eventually, I'm sure before the hour ends, we'll talk about FTX and what's going on, but we'll get there eventually. Mm -hmm. But this idea of people being smart, you know who else was a Baker Scholar? Jeffrey Skilling. Wow. Did you know that? I did not. Yeah. So anyhow, I want to go back and, to And bank, Bankman Fraud was a, some kind of a scholar at yeah. MIT, right? I mean, you, it's yeah. intelligence, ethics. EQ, IQ, so many different things. Let's come back to that, but I want to share with you because I think you'll find it amusing, and it relates directly to why I'm such um, a heavy user of what you do here at Hedgeye, and I have been for a long time. Um, but <coughs> my favorite trust but verify story goes back to, I was on a business trip to Northern California, and like you, I'm a really early riser, but when I'm in California, it's ridiculously <laughs> early. I'm sure you have the same problem. So you get out there and you're up at like 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> So I had a pretty nice place, and I wandered. I look in the, in the, in the hotel guide, and it says they open for breakfast at 6. So I go out and do my morning run. I shower. I'm ready for the day. And I'm standing at the opening at the little gate to the restaurant at 5.55 a.m. I'm the only one there. There's no one except the, the crew that's getting ready to pour the coffee. And a, an older gentleman walks up to me. I nod. He nods. And, and he looks at me and says, are you dining alone? And I said, well, when they open up, uh, I'm going to go right in and eat. I'm from the East Coast. And he said, um, well, I'm alone too, would you like to have breakfast with me? And I said, sure, Coach Wooden. It was John Wooden. Wow. So I got to trust but verify, because I had already heard, he had published his, his memoir, that first day of practice every year, you may know this story, Keith, you probably do. Did you know what he used to do with his team? No, I don't. These were the, the best recruits from all around the country, right? I mean, he got Al Cinder, Kareem, to come all the way from New York, from Powers to play in UCLA. So you've got the best of the best. First minute of the first practice, he says, everybody's suited up, ready to go. He says, take off your shoes and, shoes and socks. You've never heard this? No. Yeah. And he says, I need for you, first day, to learn how to put on your socks properly. Because if you don't, you're likely to get blisters because you're going to do so much running. And if you get blisters, you can't play. And if you can't play, you can't win a championship. And he said, then I'm going to teach you how to put your sneakers on and to lace them up properly so you don't get blisters and you can move quickly than the competition. Wow. And he would do that, and they would be stunned, these, guys, these top recruits. <laughs> and when they finished lacing all the shoes, he would walk away and say, that's the end of the practice, just to drive home the point. And I asked him at breakfast, I said, A, did you do that? And B, why did you do it? And he looked at me and said, of course I did it. I wrote about it in my memoir. And he said, and I did it because I didn't want him to get blisters. I wanted him to be able to run faster than the competition. And most importantly, I wanted them to understand that the details really matter. Mm -hmm. Well, they do win championships. They did. Yeah. yeah, he was a remarkable human being. Mm -hmm. So now we look around here and say the details really matter. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting from the world where I come from is the, the details that you furnish for me, and this has been true for years, right? Even though the, the resources have gotten better and better and better to your credit and others here, I know you'd be the first to give credit to the mm -hmm. team. Um, they've gotten better and better over the years. But for me, as I've said to some of your colleagues, it's the single best productivity hack I've encountered in my career, Hedgeye. And why is that, right? It's for a couple of different reasons that are related to each other. I like it and I was delighted to see over the weekend because I'm very much aware living in Cambridge as I do of the work that's on, going on at MIT on fusion. Commonwealth Fusion Systems, mm -hmm. and you probably saw over the weekend Lawrence Livermore Laboratory out in California, the, the government announced that they've achieved a net energy gain from fusion, mm -hmm. which is a game changer. Right? Big time. So eventually your guys will be all over that, right? <laughs> we're, we're years away from commercial application of that, but this is a big deal. And I said, that, that's it. Hedge eye for me. I've always called it a productivity hack. It's a net energy gain. I said, well, what the hell does that mean? 
and I've said this to a number of people that have eventually you know, joined the hedge I fold, and it's, it, I view exercise this way too. Uh, you know, like when I exercise, I take X minutes or hours in a day to exercise. It doesn't cost me time, it, it gains me time. Mm -hmm. Because the other hours I'm working hard, I'm much more productive. Mm -hmm. Hedge eye is the same way. I can look at all the things, look back at all the things I used to look at, and say, I don't need to look at them anymore. I can just look at this resource. Mm -hmm. And it's comprehensive. And if, if Genron, if you want to go to slide eight, I just want to make sure I cover it because this is essentially, I'm here to thank you for all the good work you've done. Yeah, this is a, uh, this is a framework. I don't know if you've seen this, Keith, mm -hmm. but. I'm just looking at the teleprompter. Yeah. Right now. yeah. I got a whole bunch of questions for you. So you, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking, but I'm going to fire them at you in a minute. But this is a four-part framework that I've used repeatedly in my career. And it's, it, I think you'll get a kick out of it. I don't know if you can read it. Here. There you go. Thank you. But, um, the beginning opens with this idea that when you're screening for an employee or a service provider, a money manager, in this case, Yale was looking for a new president in around 1950, and they put out the, the search criteria, and they were uniformly, enthusiastically favorable criteria. These are all the qualities we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And as I say in the slide, it caused one alum to say, I didn't know God was a Yale man. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> But, but that's not the way you and I have hired people over the years, right? No. What you got to do, you first screen for the negative criteria. Is the guy an asshole? Out, right? Mm -hmm. The disqualifying attributes, unfavorable, favorable, and then essential attributes in that order. Mm -hmm. Because you can confirm the presence of the negative easier and in a more timely manner than you can confirm the presence of the positive. Mm -hmm. So I put this framework together some time ago, and it just happens to describe, I think, really nicely what you got going on here. Right? Thank, thank so, you. I mean, that's a, it's amazing. I mean, disqualifying. I mean, unprincipled people, you know, we can say assholes. I mean, I, I always, when people, when I, when somebody asks me, a senior person asks me about joining this place, they say, what does it take to become a partner? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, you have to be able to produce, but if you're not in principle oriented with our principles, I don't care what you produce. It's just that you're not going to, it's not going to work out. So we might as well just figure that out right now. Yeah. And the conversation goes one of two ways. It's a shortcut to getting to like you say, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a faster way to get to no. Yeah. You know, so if it's a no, I just assume that it's a no. It, it's, it's, it's actually pretty hard to find, um, you know, to f find the right people. Yeah. I agree with all that and not, but tying it back into that framework, right? What is your scarcest resource if you're a, professional investor. You, you, you have the solemn duty, a fiduciary duty of managing money, people's money, other people's money effectively. Your scarcest constraint, some days it can feel like it's capital, particularly if you're subject to capital outflows, and we can talk about BREIT later on, <laughs> or FTX. Uh, but your, your scarcest resource is time. Mm -hmm. And that's why Hedge Eye is so valuable, because when you go through this and you realize, okay, did the people that are putting this research, research together really understand the way markets function, right? You quote Rucker and Miller all the time, don't invest in the present, invest in the future, right? Look ahead. Calculus, rates of change, mm -hmm. and Mandelbrot, which brings me to a question. Did you ever have a conversation with him? He, he was at Yale while you were a student. Right? Yeah, I have. Did you have him as a teacher? No. Yeah. He was, um, he was also very difficult to have a conversation with. Like because of his accent? Uh, no, he was just, his, like, his, very, his, his, his EQ was very low. Like, he, he's not <laughs> as socially inept, uh, borderline socially inept, yeah. like weird. Um, yeah. He'd sit by himself in the dining hall, and you'd have to talk to him. To, to, how I talked to him was I just went up and put my, I asked, I had my tray, I said, hey, do you, do you mind, Professor, if I, can, if I can share lunch with you or whatever, well, I think it was lunch. Yeah. And, um, it was just kind of like it was, he was older. Not that that's a disqualifier, but yeah. he was not really in the present, like of having a conversation, you know. With yeah, but still, I mean, I was like, he's the guy who wrote the book. This guy's like, <laughs> it's the real deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. What a privilege. Yeah, but this happened. This happened actually at Yale when I was not at Yale. It's when my office was on Yale campus. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah. So he was there before as before um, he passed away in 2010. Yeah, yeah. he was um, cuz we we went there in 08. Yeah. So I figured yeah. out how to find him. Yeah. And that's when I went there. 
So he wasn't there. Like I, when I was at Yale, Bob Schiller was definitely mm -hmm. the star. I mean, that for me, that that, that would easy, you could easily go up to yeah. and have many discussions about mean reversion, which is why I initially you know bought into rates of change in mean reversion. Yeah, yeah. So. Did you know that Mandelbrot was the oldest academic to ever get tenure at Yale? Uh, I did not know that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because he worked at IBM, as you know, for yep. like 35 years yeah. and then went up to New Haven. He was the oldest, really. Oldest to ever get tenure. Hmm. You know who the youngest to ever get tenure at Harvard was? Larry Summers. Ooh. I'm he'd be a, the first to tell I'm me I'm not that. a fan. Yeah, he'd, <laughs> he'd be the first to remind me of that. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, when I started following what you were doing, before I, before I started using it in earnest, I discussed this with Robert driving down from Boston yesterday. Um, I ran kind of a parallel system for like three or four years. I, I think this is actually, it's important for me to say this publicly because it's an admission and a confession and I think it might help some people get over it. Can you send that to me routinely? It's terrific. And I would do that for a whole bunch of you. I want to help people and be a good guy. And then I would look at your stuff every day and say, my stuff is terrific. It's, it's comprehensive. It's elegant. It's, it's really easy to get through. Uh, but I can't make sense of it, right? Like there's no unifying system to tell me what to do. It's not actionable, hmm. right? And then I look at the hedge eye stuff and it's actionable, right? Because it's rooted in the way markets actually work, right? It's, it's rooted in what Mandelbrot taught us about there being order and disorder, right? Um, and the, the fractal nature of markets and it's rooted in calculus, which is rates of change. So you persuaded me without ever knowing it and without ever talking to me directly <laughs> to sort of put aside and finally then at, at some you know, point that I recall vividly that's not worthy of discussion, saying to others, you know, I don't look at that stuff anymore. You can keep looking at our dashboard, but I'm using this. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And here's the reason why. I, I mean, first of all, that's quite yeah. humbling. So thank yeah. you for saying that. Um, secondly, it, it brings like, it jogs my memory on, like over the years, some people have said, well, what he does or what they do at Hedgeye is just copying Ray Dalio. Or you could do this easily on your own. They just look at this two by two model and that's it. Um, I, of course, like, you know, my life's work with all the teammates that I have contributing to it, you know, deliberately every day and evolving it. Like, how do you say that? Because um, mm -hmm. obviously that's, you know, I, I take that as an insult, right? I mean, but I think it's meant to trivialize like what we've accomplished. Yeah. I don't know what you, if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, that actually triggers me in, in the following rather, to me, important sense, but I'll be precise about it. Um, what it triggers is a number of conversations I've had with serious allocators, people running big institutional funds or big family offices that yep. I've had the privilege of, in my Gumpian way, of observing, right, and, and conversing with and interacting, in some cases advising. And I'll say to them, just trust me on this, give this a try and see if it isn't for you as for me a net energy gain, mm -hmm. right? It, it will free you up from spending time reading the FT and the Wall Street Journal and these other things that you're yep. accustomed to reading. And in the hours that you're otherwise working, it will make those hours more productive, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's both a, a weather warning system of what lies ahead, approaching storms or approaching fair weather. You do both, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really important too. And it's also like a fish finder, right? Like yep. where are the opportunities today? And the most common objection I get, and the more senior and experienced people are, the more likely they are to say to me, David, I would never rely on a single source for something that important. And I say, I know, I've heard that before. So tell me exactly what you're doing today. You say, well, I read the FT and I read the Wall Street Journal, I read this and I read that, and I look and I look at Morgan Stanley and I get stuff from Goldman, and I say, and then now who's synthesizing it and putting it all together and deciding what to act on? And they say, well, I am. And I say, so you're a single source, right? And hear me out. Look at this stuff from Hedge Eye and ask yourself in an honest, self-aware way, are you better at this than the team? that Hedge Eye has assembled. And there may be, you can't prove the negative, which is why I asked you about the, the SAT score at Yale. You can't prove yet that you absolutely had the lowest. So I can't prove to the world that this is the single best, or as I like to say, the least worst way of, of understanding the weather that's approaching, good or, or poor, and having a fish finder. I can't prove to the world. There may be a superior system. 
I simply haven't encountered one. That's yeah. a, that, that, again, uh, and in full disclosure, I had no idea it was going to be this complimentary, but this is, um, because I take a lot of, I mean, the criticism would also be like, how can he say that he doesn't use anyone, he doesn't care about what anyone else is, he doesn't use anyone else's, um, he doesn't read the FT, he makes fun of the Wall Street Journal, he does, he, you know, he doesn't care what, like I was just at the YPO Edge, um, you know, conference, which is basically the mm -hmm. amalgamation of all the great young presidents and entrepreneurs in the world, according to, to, to whoever and us, and Larry Summers is going to tell us uh, the path forward in the economy. And I, anyone who asked me, I said, I'd, I, I heard him, yeah, I've heard him many times, I just, there's nothing he said that's going to change what I do. So mm -hmm. people take that as cocky, arrogant. To me, it's more like the opposite. It's like, why would I waste my time on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, and when I saw your, I don't know if we can put this up, but you know, we should be able to, the mistakes you're trying to avoid. One of the mistakes is don't presume outside views capture inner workings. <laughs> like this is, this, I think that that, and by the way, I did not know that you were going to highlight it in red, but of, I, I picked what I thought were the, the, you know, I circled, like I like this. I need to trust, but yeah, verify. I mean, yeah, no, I did. I, I, I circled the ones that I that okay, at least ahead. to me were the most, you know, because I didn't want to use all ten. And to me, that was like exactly. That's what I think. I'm not trying to offend people. Yeah. I'm just trying to save people time. Yeah. You know, the whole point of our process, like if you yeah. look at slide 20 in the current deck, uh, Genron can show it, is that I have a rate of change color coded dashboard that starts me. Like, mm -hmm. there's nowhere else that I would start. Mm -hmm. If Larry Summers told me that the Chinese told him that they're going to reopen tomorrow, I couldn't change like what I'm going to do with that. Yeah. Yeah, you're triggering a bunch of other thoughts too. Let's come back. <laughs> I, 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 I keep saying because the inner workings takes you right to the FTX Sequoia venture thing, but let's not go there just yet. Right. Because I want I don't want to sound like a sycophant to the audience, right? Either live or on replay. So let me now say publicly to you that when I it, it, given how many hours I've spent absorbing the knowledge and the wisdom and the data that you've furnished over the years, I nonetheless think that there's something missing. It's not necessarily missing from Hedgeye, but it's missing from well-intentioned people who rely on Hedgeye in the absence of a more, uh, sorry, not a more, in the absence of a solid foundation, what I call investment policy. So I want to talk about that for a little bit, Great. okay? That's actually mistake number one, right, in that list, right? Yep is trying to serve multiple masters equally. So, Genron, if you can go to, I think it's three, slide three. Which, by the way, I didn't circle that one, as you can see, yeah. because <laughs> I don't have multiple masters. I mean, so I'm like, to me, yeah, yeah. like I'm yeah. selfishly looking at this list of court in, in yeah. terms of how it applies to me, but yeah. I didn't know what you meant by that. So, as we dive into this, I'll do, I'll do it really quickly, but I think it's important. I'm just trying to help members of Hedge Eye Nation that are watching this, right? Yep. And it may not help, it may make them worse investors, but I'm just telling the truth, okay? I look at, you know, if I said to you, what are the most elegant fractals that man has ever devised or that you've ever seen? I would say, well, the Eiffel Tower is a very attractive yes. fractal, right? It's not cauliflower. It's in some ways more attractive. <laughs> when you look at it, and I look at Hedge Eye like an Eiffel Tower, right? So, like, what's at the base, right? You know, you've got, obviously, the quads, right? And you've got the signal, and the signal trumps the quads, something I'll come back to in a minute, because mm -hmm. you've got to rank order your policy parameters. If you don't, you're dead. Right? And I would think you would argue, if you just go by the quads here and don't pay attention to the signal, you can destroy pretty capital, capital pretty and quickly. And by policy, you mean, what? like I say, these are my rules. I'll come, rules I'll come yeah. back to it. It's on the slide. Right? Okay. It's on slide three, Eric, uh, the do's of investment policy making. Right? But go back to the Eiffel Tower uh, analog mm -hmm. on fractals. Right? What's beneath the ground of the Eiffel Tower? Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure, but I can guess, and so can you. It's like a really solid foundation, <laughs> right? Because he knew he wanted to go, Eiffel knew he wanted to go up pretty high. By the way, he built it to be deconstructed right after the World's Fair, but they never took it down because they just thought it was so elegant, and thank goodness they didn't. But there's a really solid foundation underneath, yeah. and the foundation is right here on slide three. So you got to figure out, and I've done this, I've had the great privilege of doing this with a number of asset owners, which I define as endowments, foundations principally, mm -hmm family offices. I try to screen my family office clients to make sure they're really philanthropic because it's the people I really enjoy working with. So they all have a really long-term view. But let's be honest, they got to think about risk. Yep. 
think about risk first and then return, not the other way around. It's not like Yale says we need to pay out 5% of the endowment every year. So mathematically and tautologically, we've got to get a 5% real return. That's true, right? But I would argue if an institution does that, they do return and then risk, mm -hmm. they're eventually going to hit a brick wall, right? It's got to be the opposite way around. So you've got to think about what are the risks that I must incur to achieve a satisfactory return. We'll quantify that down the road. And as I go down those list of risks, maybe I want to put guardrails on them, right? Of some kind. Typically, if you look at an investment policy statement for a major endowment foundation, it'll be between 10 and 20 pages. You know this. They'll have mins, norms, and maxes for US stocks. They're, they're wildly price insensitive. So to me, they don't make any sense. They're imprudent. It's not codifying prudence, it's codifying imprudence mm -hmm. because they're price insensitive parameters, but you gotta start somewhere. And I've been through this conversation with so many people at so many institutions and committees and boards and all that, that I've learned to go through this process of do's and don'ts. So let's think about risk. Like what is this, the Mucker family office you talk about all the time. Say so like if Jack or Reese or anybody in between, right, says to you, hey dad, like, what is the cardinal risk that you're not willing to incur or only willing to incur up to a certain degree? What would your answer be? A, a breakout in volatility of the asset class. But, what, but that's only a symptom. What's the underlying thing that you're trying to guard against? Against a drawdown. A drawdown, yeah. exactly. So when you look at all of my work, and you'll see drawdown is the principal parameter. Mm -hmm. Typically, in an institutional context, which is why we come to the term don't serve multiple masters mm -hmm. or try to do so equally, if you go to Yale, if you go to any major foundation, a lot of family offices, to their detriment, will say, our primary goal is to you know, get great returns without incurring drawdowns that do irreparable harm to the family or to the institution. And then they'll typically, in the institutional context, add a, peer, a, a relative return parameter, a different master. Hmm. That relative return parameter can be a market index or a hybrid, 60-40, or it can be a peer group. Mm -hmm. In the case of the big time endowments, it's a peer group. We want to outperform the Nakubo benchmark of endowments yes. over a billion dollars. That's a relative return parameter, right? In some cases, they have the relative return parameter without the absolute return parameter, right? The drawdown. And they get into big trouble. Mm. I will argue a little bit later that that's how we got the FTX debacle, mm. right? Because everybody's trying to outperform everybody else mm -hmm. when, in fact, what they ought to do is focus more attention on their liabilities, mm -hmm. right? In any case, finishing this monologue, you go through and you do your dues of investment policy making on slide three, right? What needs to be in the investment policy statement? And on the next slide, slide four, you don't do all the don'ts <laughs> that cause most investment policy statements to be 20 pages where they should ideally be 272 words, which is, I think, the next slide, Eric. Uh, next one after that. Yeah. So this is my preferred policy statement. The norm is about 10, 15 pages, and mine's 272 words. How Why? long did it take you to get it down to that? Yeah, that's like asking um, Jeff Hamilton, <laughs> how long did it take you to get to the NHL? <laughs> 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 a lot of cold mornings and late nights. Yeah, yeah. It, a long time. But why is it 272? I, I'm semi-serious when I say this. That was a, exactly the number of words that Abraham Lincoln used in what I regard as the best policy statement ever devised, the, the Gettysburg wow. Address. That's right? awesome. You read it, yeah. it's only, it only takes a second, it's yeah. 272 words, many people have memorized it, I have not, and it's a policy statement. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's rank ordering what the goals are. It was for a political regime. You know who, right? th 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 this is how he cracked, this is how John Boyd, the mad major, Oodle loops. cracked the code. Of yeah. now, he knew what he thought, he just couldn't get it to the manual. And once he got it to the manual and it was brief enough, yeah. he, 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 he made it, you know, like he, he, that was his moment. Yeah. Where he, when he went from being this batshit crazy, mad major is what they call him, to a, having quite literally changed yeah. the Air Force and, and the Navy SEALs. I'm so glad you mentioned that, because I, I think about this a lot when I watch you and Daryl do what you do from here in the morning. Because I think the tendency is to think OODA loop is like day trading. Right? It's like minutes, <laughs> and you, you know, you help people with their tactics with RTAs, real-time alerts. Yeah. Um, some people watching the show will not know what those are, and I encourage them to go have a look at it. That's the very tip of the Eiffel Tower, right? That's 
that's trying to be good at every aspect of the game, including the very short-term tactical. Mm -hmm. It's like, why not, right? Why not try to be good at everything? <laughs> Thank like, you for telling people. This. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're right in the World Cup, right? It'd be like, I see this with endowments. It's part of my talk that that you're quoting from, right? Like they, they try to make the job easier. The CIOs make the job easier than it is. It's like a coach saying, we don't need to practice PKs, either the the offensive guys who are going to have to take the kicks or the goalie. Let's they don't we don't need them because it only happens once once in a while. And my response to that is, no, if you're going to play at the highest level, you've got to practice every aspect of the game. So you've got to be good at the top of the Eiffel Tower, but if you don't have a solid foundation, it's going to tip over eventually. You're not going to get yeah, to the top get, of the Eiffel Tower. You can't Eiffel even Tower. get up there. And yeah. it's not, a, it's, it's not a, an adequate criticism to say, because you're oodle looping up there, yeah. you know, after we've built, you know, everybody loves the movie, but it took a long time to get the aircraft that Maverick was flying. <laughs> To get the intelligence system that he had in order to operate it, that's the foundation. Yeah. I mean, but everybody loves it when you're in the dogfight at the very top, right. or they don't. The, the, the academics would tell me he's he's too short term because he's flying around up there all the yeah. time. What I'm actually doing up there is trying to one make money, um, but two prove that all that work underneath, there's 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 a way to optimize and to mm -hmm. capitalize on that. Yeah. I mean. But I, I want to take this one step further, if I can, with the utmost respect and affection, and say that the OODA loop, which can be extremely effective at any level of the Eiffel yeah, Tower, right. is incredibly effective at the lowest, most important level. Yep. Right. So understanding, and you know, I don't know of any research boutiques who have a demographer, for goodness sakes, let alone the world's best demographer. Right. So we have trade, trend, tail, and we have Neil. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like the really long term. <laughs> But, you know, if, if you're a serious dude, a serious CIO, man or woman, running a big pot yeah. of money for an endowment foundation, this is sacred capital, it's a sacred trust, and you study the OODA loop phenomena and aspects of deploying capital with that really long-term time horizon, you're going to do really well. Yeah. But if you don't, you won't, right? And, you know, your alma mater, and I... I love the guy. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Swenson, he was incredibly helpful early in my career. He got hired as CIO at Yale in the spring of 1985 at age 31, mm -hmm. right? Why on earth would they do that? They did that because for the decade and a half prior to that, the real inflation-adjusted value of the Yale endowment had gone down more than 50%, mm -hmm. right? So they looked around and said, we, there must be a better way, right? Now, they didn't make the mistake of hiring a young guy who was inexperienced like Bankman Freed. We'll come back to that. I keep <laughs> saying that, but we will. We won't end the hour without talking about him. But they hired a guy who had the ethics, the work ethic, and the open mind to say there must be a better way. I just need to figure it out, which is what David did. It was a great contribution to the not-for-profit sector, really to investing, generally mm -hmm. speaking, to put together the model that he did. It's, it has happened. I mean, and look at the NFL now. It's very common to have a coach in his early 30s. Yeah, yeah. You know, just because we're, we're at a different, you know, different phase of this game's evolution, you know, different tools, different minds. It's, it's okay. You know, yeah. when I started Hedge, I was 30, I think it was 33. Um, yeah. And it was okay. And it was also okay that David Swenson wasn't entirely interested in my work. Yeah. That, to me, was somewhat of a comp. He was quite literally, I could... Hit a driver from the from the parking lot. Yeah, I yeah, had I know you were. His. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know they were doing their thing, and mm -hmm. what I was doing is like you know it's like well, if, if you have your rules based process, it's like somebody coming in and telling me to change mine. Like I respected that. Yeah, I mean it's not there's it wasn't like ill will. I mean he's a huge Yale hockey fan too, so we were quite quite friendly with him. But um, yeah, a bri brilliant. I mean brilliant in terms of his application. Like I've met a lot of brilliant people. Uh, obviously, that are still in academia for that reason. But brilliance to me is taking that and applying it and delivering the returns. What mm -hmm. he did was phenomenal. Yeah. One of the most intensely competitive people I've ever met. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He was Yale season, Yale hockey season tickets, right in the best seat in the house. He would be that. He loved watching competition mm -hmm. too. He's just, yeah. he, he married um, my first boss at Yale. Megan. She yeah. was the uh, tennis uh, coach, mm -hmm. and I was the uh, data 
person for the tennis team. <laughs> I didn't Women, know that. Yeah. as you might suspect. So let's let's <laughs> let's use that to segue over. We're talking about young dudes. Let's let's now get to FTX a bit. Oh yeah. Because I don't know if you know this, but one of my other favorite, very favorite people in my Forrest Gump travels through the uh, professional path I've wandered is Scott Malpass. And I don't know if you know Scott. He, he recently retired as CIO at, at Notre Dame. Uh, I, I, I know David Malpass, but yeah, no, I don't know Scott. Malpass. Right, no relation. But Scott was named CIO at his alma mater in 1988 at age 26. Really? Really. Now, why is that connected to FTX? Because they never would have made, put him in that seat or put David in his seat in New Haven at the age that they were with the experience they did not have if they weren't subject to oversight and governance. Yep. And that is one of the obvious, much discussed aspects of the FTX debacle, mm -hmm. right? No real functioning board, right? And the old adage, I'm sure you've heard it, no organization can be better than its board. Mm -hmm. That's true, right? And mm -hmm. the, you look at the board of FTX, but I actually think there's a phenomenon that I've heard very little discussed that merits, and I'd love to get your reaction to it, because people ask me these days, like every hour, like, what do you think of this FTX thing? What do you think of crypto? Is he going away for a long time? Or, and my view of it is everything you hear about and read about in the media, make of what you will, there's really almost nothing I can say about it that's not been widely discussed, except the following, that if you look at the real root cause of the problem, and I don't want to sound too critical of the people I'm about to flag, but the real root cause of the problem is if you look at the chain of financing that eventually wound its way onto the cap table at FTX, yeah, you've got Sequoia and you've got Tomasic, and clearly they got some wood to chop there to figure out why the hell they bought into this hook, mm -hmm. line, and sinker. I know you're from Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay is in Ontario. I know you got property in Thunder Bay. You may end up, because they were on that cap table, right? Ontario teachers. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, then they subjected the teachers to these losses. No, 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 that's a defined benefit plan, not DC, DB. So the taxpayers eventually are gonna have to pick up the tab for that shocking absence of due diligence, right? So you got Sequoia, the people on the cap table, and then you can say, well, what about Yale? Yale's a Sequoia LP. Mm -hmm. Do they deserve any part of the blame? You say, well, what pressures were Sequoia subject to? They were subject over the entire glorious stellar history of the firm to pressures from individual LPs. Can you take some more money from me, mm -hmm. right? I know, I've been in those rooms for those conversations, right? In fact, I flew out to California years ago for the specific purposes of sort of getting down my hands and knees with Mike Moritz, the then head of Sequoia, to beg him for an allocation for TIFF, because mm -hmm. TIFF had a large scale venture program. Uh, and he said no, hmm. right? Because we don't want to. We want to work directly with asset owners, not with intermediaries like TIFF. Fine, I respected that. But there's massive pressure to grow and grow and grow. And what does that produce eventually? It produces the conversation that was nauseatingly on the Sequoia website until Mark and you spilled the beans, so to speak, and everything blew up, and they removed it from the website. Crazy. But it was. Have you read that? Mm. That well, it was on the Sequoia website. Yeah. You, you need to take a shower after you. After and you now read. there are multiple spoofs of it because it was yeah. so bad of a. Yeah. You know, but why? Give them the benefit example. of the doubt, Keith. Why were they so excited to hear Sam say what he said in that pitch? It's because he was saying, "Well, there's essentially no market that we couldn't eventually dominate," and they're putting so much money to work that they need to look at something that has the potential to be the next Amazon, the next Microsoft, the next massive scaled enterprise. So there's just, it's an excess aggregation of capital. There's another factor though, and then I'll stop and turn it back to you, which was to me, smilingly alluded to in my little tweet to you this morning. Did you actually have the lowest SAT score at Yale? Because I said, your, your answer could change like higher ed for the better, admissions processes. Right? Let's go for the guy with a strong work ethic and good values with the lowest score because he's going to work really hard to overcome the handicaps he's had. Maybe, maybe not. Right? Uh, that, there's another reason why I did that because I said it could have, your answer could have the potential to reduce the probability of future FTX scams. And what is that? Mm -hmm. And I've seen this over and over and over again which is you get people that have fancy degrees, fancy career paths, 
And when they sit down and get into a conversation with somebody like Sam Bankman Freed, particularly where they feel privileged to have the conversation, like he's not talking with all the VC firms, he's talking with just a few, and where on the short list, where does that go? Ego. And when your ego expands, your critical faculties shrink. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's the rub of the problem. And I, I would love to see, I don't want to sound like I'm overstating either the problem or the solution, but I would love to see a conversation throughout higher ed about admissions. I'd love to see a conversation in the real world, so to speak, about how much value do we actually ascribe to somebody when they show up with a fancy degree or a fancy career path. Yeah. Does it really get to the rub of what's needed to be successful? It's, um, we've been having this discussion to a degree, uh, not as well articulated as, as you just did, and I think you uniquely do, but we've been having an HR discussion internally about, because I have a, you know, one of the rules of running the business is you have to meet with me for your last interview, because right? I want to make sure that if I, you know, we have a conversation, a real conversation like this, we look each other in the eyes, and yeah. if any of my spidey senses go the wrong way, then I'm, I have a series of questions to ask, not only directly, but also, um, and I also do it for the incoming uh, teammate, because I like to tell them, if anything ever goes wrong with anyone that you're working with here, I want you to feel comfortable to, I don't even sit in the office anymore, just come over to me and yeah. say, hey, do you have some time? And I'll, I'll try to help you figure it out because I don't want you to like leave without you know without this being explored. Sure. You know, so but the um, we had one hire uh, recently that I didn't uh, for whatever reason I, I skimped. I didn't I didn't do the meeting. And didn't it was a didn't quick quick exit. Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'd be really interested to know what fraction of the folks who've made it through all the other filters and get to Keith's filter have gotten rejected by Keith? Uh, a fair amount. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> You're a leader. Yeah, I mean, it's not... Yeah, I... I it's just, you know, um, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, I've, I'm sometimes asked, I do a lot of interviewing of money managers over the years, right? And people say, like, if you could only ask one question, you know, what would you ask? And I, I have an instant answer, which I really am firmly wedded to. And it's, it's germane to what we were just talking about. If I can only ask one question of a money manager that's like pitching wants to get money that I'm responsible mm -hmm. for, the question is, describe for me, ideally, since I only get one question, in great detail, the investment opportunity to which you devoted the most time and mental bandwidth and decided ultimately to pass. And the reason that's the question more than any other is because, again, if they answer at length, it will reveal the discipline, the process that you place so much emphasis mm -hmm. on around here. Well, so that's why I asked, how many get to your desk yeah. and get rejected I mean, by you? It's, it's, um, I think that that's a major problem for, in particular, hedge fund managers that are resource constrained right now or any mm -hmm. asset manager that doesn't have the horses they feel like they, and they'll tell you this, they'll feel like they almost owe the portfolio position given the amount of work that the yeah, person put into it. It's a kiss of death. So it's a killer, you yeah. know, whereas like I'm, and you can see as I get older, I get more indifferent about, about what I buy and sell because, yeah. you know, we can do 200 hours of work over here where I can have 20 minutes worth of signal over there on duration right now that mm -hmm. is going to put my eggs over there. I mean, I don't have to, I've, I've spent 23 years working on that one. Mm -hmm. It's just this particular moment, it's a much better decision. Yeah. So I, I, I think that that's a major structural issue because you're basically tied all together. We have all these super smart people in the hedge fund business. You know, I, I, I don't know, um, I mean, where my SAT score would fit on the first selections <laughs> yeah. of people that Goldman would have picked <laughs> right. and then, you know, people that Bridgewater would have picked. But again, if you just, that, I didn't get hired by those places. <laughs> you know, there's a reason. Yeah. It wasn't because I didn't have a C on my jersey. Yeah. It's because, again, you, you got Phi Beta Kappa. The, the industry is loaded with academic credential. And it's, it's yeah. just, but EQ and the ability to read people, like when I, when I first went to Carlisle, when they said, well, what, what, what do you want to, I was there briefly, but like what were some of the things that you would do that other people haven't done here? I say, I said, we take the whole analyst team and they have to be trained in kinesics, the study of line. Sure. And we'll have 
two yeah. the guys that I just you know at my old firm that I engaged will have these two FBI guys. Yeah. First, do it to, to the analysts, and then the analysts learn why there's two people doing the interview, yeah. and why the one who's really asking the questions isn't the one who knows what's going on. Like it's <laughs> it's a real like it's a real. There's so much work to do, in, as yeah. you know, in this profession. Yeah, it's one of the few professions, you know, that get paid at the highest level, that has not evolved. Yeah, yeah. In in any way, which include all the team dynamics, the HR buildup. You know, like you said, what is what is the actual or what are the actual attributes of a person or a player on a team? that can help drive alpha over cycles, like w w what are their attributes? It's not yeah. your SAT score. Yeah. It's ridiculous, Yeah, you know? Um, I'm remi I'll tell this story very briefly, but um, I'm reminded of an instance when I was at TIFF where I got wind of the group that had formed in Boston, still exists, business intelligence advisors that trains people to detect its deception. You probably met those guys men and women, and, um, and I said, oh, that'd be great. That'd be a fun thing to do for the TIFF board. Everybody's deploying serious capital. <laughs> yeah. So we had a board meeting. I think we actually did it in Boston. And then we spent the afternoon on this stuff. And the reason I tell the story is because it was the very first day of work of a guy that I'm extremely fond of. I'll give him a direct shout out, John Thorndike. He's running the division where I worked at GMO way back in the day. And he's mm. sort, of, sort of first among equals in charge of it now. But he worked for me for many years at TIFF. This was his first day at TIFF. And in the room, undergoing this training, is Swenson and Jack Meyer, and you know the best and the brightest of their generation of endowment and foundation types. The head of Stanford and Duke, and a pretty illustrious crowd. And at certain distinct points in this afternoon-long training, you get tested. OK, you saw these videos. You saw three people. They're all testifying to the same. Who's lying? We can tell you, in fact, Two of the three people that you watched on video are telling the truth, and one of them is lying. And they polled us, and we didn't do secretive polls. We just put our hands in the air. And at one point, everybody had their hand in the air except the young Turk whose first day it was. And I turned to him and said, you know, you're going to vote against Meyer and Swenson? And he said, yeah, they're, I'm right and they're wrong. And then they revealed the answer. And there were like 20 of us in the room with cumulative, you know, 1,000 years of experience. Yeah. The young guy was right, right? Well, what you learn in, the, in that investigative, that kind of process, is that it's process. It doesn't depend on one person. <laughs> no kidding. Right? So one person can really get lucky, uh, or, the, or the lack of process, the opinion over process, yeah. can be really bad. I yeah. mean, it's, there's so many. Um, I yeah. do have to, I, I want to ask some other people's questions. If you have questions, um, please put them in the queue, and we'll see you know, what gets voted up. But before, before we go there, uh, this, this you know, got a, a check for me. Um, don't mistake marketing schemes for asset classes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Marketing schemes masquerading as asset classes is the way I put it. I mean, if, if, yeah. if crypto and, wasn't one, I yeah. mean, I, I don't know what is. But. Yeah. And in, well, we could talk about that. I think there's um, there are exceptions within the crypto universe that prove the rule, which mm -hmm. I talked about in that talk that you're alluding to, which yep. I, I think probably goes beyond the scope of today's conversation, but. I think ETH has some singular characteristics that could enable it to be a very useful resource for a long time to come. Uh, I'm very hard pressed to identify anything that I have comparable confidence in. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the marketing schemes masquerading as asset classes have been big traps and costly ones yep. for a lot of allocators f f time immemorial. So I cited in the talk BRICS, which, you know, yep. um, what's his name came up with it at Goldman, yep. O'Neill, Jim O'Neill. Good guy, mm -hmm. but there was no coherence to it, right? So you look at institutional frameworks of the sort that I extolled earlier, where I said the base of the Eiffel Tower has to be really sound policy. If you don't have that, you're likely to tip over at some point in time. The manifestation of that, of that rigor, that solid foundation, tends to be these policy statements. As we've discussed, the shorter the better. Mm -hmm. But the, to the extent that they get overly long and prolix, to the point where they don't provide any meaningful guidance whatsoever. It's usually because you see these line items that have marketing schemes masquerading as asset classes mm -hmm. or contractual schemes. This is not an original thought. You'll see a line that says hedge funds, <laughs> right? And then you look at what's in the portfolio of hedge funds, or technically a sub-portfolio within the larger portfolio. And as I like to say, an asset class is very rare in the world. It should comprise exclusively assets whose intrinsic value, as distinct from market price, has the same common fundamental drivers, mm -hmm. right? 
So in the longer scheme of things, you could say, well, equities belong in a certain bucket. But hedge funds don't, <laughs> right? Sometimes you'll see people that are embarrassed to put hedge funds, and they'll put the, the line item that David Swenson came up with. I remember exactly where we were walking in Boston when he told me about it early in his career. And he said, I'm going to set up a new segment of the fund, if I can get it past Charlie Ellis, who was his chair, <laughs> called, called Absolute Return. He okay. eventually got it through, and it became an important part of the book, you know, that his Bible to investing. Well, but, Charlie Ellis' book, Winning, Winning the Losers Game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I, haven't, I haven't read that yet. Oh, it's a good book. I get the yeah. rule, though. <laughs> Speaking of which, because I have no idea where we are on time, I brought you a book. Oh, you did? Yeah. Thank you. Because you talk about the rule of law a lot, and, and you get it, right? Even though you're Canadian, you get what, what, what goes on down here, and a lot of it is similar to what you're familiar with up north. But this is Billy Bud the Sailor. It's Melville's last work. It's unfinished because he never got quite around to finishing it. Really? But just because time is brief here and I'm doing too much talking. You're in that book. Um, SBF's in that book. You're, some of your really good teammates are in that book. It's just not with the same name. Hmm. So I don't know if you do fiction. You usually do nonfiction. But well, if you gave it to me, I'll read take it. Take it to the beach this summer and then call me and we'll talk about it. Yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that. It's, um, I mean, it, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you're like, when I read, at least, I don't, I never, well, I never know what I'm going to learn. That's the whole point. But I never know what I'm going to learn relative to the other three things that I just read, yeah. or the, the the compendium of things that I've read. Connect the dots. And to me, that's that. When people say, "Why do you read so much?" Yeah. Some people say, "How do you read so much?" Yeah. Well, you just dedicate some time and space in your schedule yeah. to deliberately do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like when my 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 daughter Lucy the other day she said, "Dad, why do you every day take Boomer on that long walk after I get home from school?" And she's 8 now. So I said, "Well, Lucy, the market closes at 4, and that's the point in time where going on a long walk with Boomer ensures that I can hopefully be around for a long period of time with you." Yes. And she was like smiling. She's like, "Oh, well, you have a good walk with the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> it's also for me, I can stop looking at everything I look at. Yeah. <laughs> but, but quickly, your f very favorite book in the world, I think, certainly about markets, is? Misbehavior of Markets. Exactly. Yeah. And mine, too. Mm -hmm. Mine, too. Bo what did he say? Bottomless wonders spring from rules which are applied without end. Is that, that's taking Boomer for a walk every day, yeah. right? But it's doing what you do here every day. Yeah, it's a, it's, yeah. It, um, Tim Ferriss wrote a book uh, recently where he took a compendium. I just finished reading it. It's called um, uh, Tribe of Leaders. I think it's tri no, Tribe of Mentors. So it's like 125 mm -hmm. people that we'd all know. Mm -hmm. And it asks, which, what are the top three books? Da -da 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 -da. Wh what is the number one thing you do when you're not doing what people know that you do? Walk. Get away. It's something yeah. by yourself. Yeah. It's it's um it's where you you, know, you get away. It's the stillness. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, you were great the other day when you you came in with who's the the the, the artist that does the painting that you you did that for a full thirty minutes. <laughs> oh boy, that was. Tough. I do have days where I wish you would do that every day. Kate, that, by the way, that, it's that, a little calm. Right? That, that was. It was. <laughs> some people liked it. Some people didn't What's like it. What's his name? I, you forgot it on Bob, air too. Bob. Bob. Um, yeah. yeah Bob. Eric will. Bob the painter. Break in. Anyhow. Yeah. So um, we do have, uh, let's see, uh, top rank questions here. Um, these are, well, you know, the, it's not, I think this thing's actually not working really well. That's probably why. I'll just ask the next question anyway. Um, what do you mean by don't overgeneralize? Yeah, th that manifests itself a lot in my sort of day job. Um, People love yeah. narratives and to generalize. Yeah, and they're really dangerous. So uh, <laughs> the specific examples that I cited when I gave that little talk, because I wanted to be very specific about it, like people often say, well, you know, any good money manager needs to have a, a performance-based or incentive fee to do their best work, to best align their interest with that of the client, as opposed to a standard asset-based fee you see in most mutual funds. And I just disagree. Mm. I don't think that's... They might want it. They might get it. <laughs> it might be five and fifty, like some people. It might be two and twenty, or something less than that these days. But I don't believe that in each and every case it, better, it best aligns the client's interest with the manager. Hmm. I think in some cases it can actually do the reverse. Again, beyond the scope of today's conversation to do that. Secondly, um, people always sorry. I shouldn't overgeneralize myself. A lot of big allocators say cash is trash, mm -hmm. right? 
So long term, the return on cash, historically, we know the numbers. I've memorized them years ago, right? Long term return on stocks, real return, net of inflation, 7%. It's a global phenomenon. You can look it up in a book. Bonds, three ish. Mm -hmm. Cash, one if you're lucky, right? So cash is trash. If you're building one of these min norm max systems, cash gets the bare minimum for liquidity reasons. But that's just wrong. If you've actually managed a portfolio, and you have, and I have, <laughs> you know, with Serious money, cash has an option value that goes way beyond the income yield. Yeah, and it's not right? the average of it, it's it, not the it, average of returns. It's the particular return yeah. in that particular point in cycle time. Yeah. If you were just if you're long eighty percent cash this year and it's up ten percent, that's yeah. you win. Yeah. You win for the rest of your career. Yeah. Especially if you do it every time you hit a quad four recession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, other really quickly, other overgeneralizations you see a lot in my my line of work. You see people saying, "I want the manager to have serious skin in the game." Yep. Right. Well, that can be taken to an excess, right? I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I like to say pay schemes. Like, I don't know what you do here, but you say, well, ultimately our goal is to make sure everybody's an equity owner. You say, well, there's no free lunch. You know, if you're going to give people equity and you're doing it in a rigorous way uh, that, that seeks presumably to elicit the, the effort that you want, there has to be a cost ultimately in, with cash payment or your bennies. Right? So in each and every case, question, not a comment, is it the optimal arrangement to say to a valued worker, I want you to take some equity in the enterprise? They might say, no, thank you very much. I already have a lot of my fortune tied to the evolving prosperity of my employer, and I'd rather just get the cash, thank you very much, and diversify it. Or I'd rather have you take up my 401k contribution so I can invest away from the base business or the base industry in which I'm employed. Mm -hmm. So that's another generalization that I hear a lot that I just think is false. Hmm. That's really good. Uh, do you think you need to have the manager, you know, bolted to the chair or in the seat to deliver on the process? And I'm asking about Dahlia. Uh, generally speaking, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it, this is going to sound like a non sequitur, but I sort of, I both enjoy and have benefited from trying to connect dots that don't seem to merit connection, <laughs> right? I, I, I do, I think there's kind of an arbitrage in market, yeah. markets for doing that. And so the, the, the distinction, what I want to go is take that and segue over to the discussion of time horizon. I actually discussed it driving down with Robert yesterday. It was really fun. I said that I've learned over the years that there's a big distinction between the the holding period and the period applied for measuring success or failure, mm -hmm. right? So you can have Rentech-like turnover and say, but I'm going to evaluate their results over a rolling five-year period, right? Mm -hmm. The holding period is very brief. The measurement period is prudently long, particularly for permanent capital. So now we come back to your good question, like does the manager need to be bolted to their chair? And it de you could say, well, it depends. If they're really investing long term, then they don't need, they can take long vacations, right? Mm -hmm. Buy something and hold it for long term. And I would say they could, but I'm not going to give them any money because that's like hiring the soccer coach who says, we don't need to practice the PKs. It's like, why wouldn't you seek to be the very best and being the very best in our business when markets, I'm not talking crypto, I'm talking TradFi because crypto is 24 seven, but TradFi is getting there, right? We saw pre-market activity this morning that was going to be memorable. Um, so you say, I want the guy bolted, man or woman, to be bolted to their chair. Mm -hmm. Why? Because maybe 90% of all business days, they do nothing. But the other 10% of the business days, they may get great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Not with some sort of high rapid turnover short-term trading process, but to wait and wait and wait and deploy serious capital when there's a what? An involuntary seller on the other side of the trade which you and I would instantly agree, we just met today for the first time in person, what's the cardinal sin of investing? Being an involuntary seller. How do you avoid that awful fate? Get your policy right, get the base of the Eiffel Tower correct, mm -hmm. and you, you get everything lined up as best you can, you cannot do it perfectly, but spend a lot, be bolted to your chair in doing it, and stay bolted to the chair, or just get out. Mm -hmm. Get out, give it up. I love to quote the, I'm a big baseball fan, more, even more than hockey. And uh, you know the mascot for the Padres? Mm -hmm. Is a big chicken, right? <laughs> and so the guy was asked, it's really hot in San Diego. It's like 110. How do you stay in the heat? And he said, oh, 
if you can't stand the heat, get out of the chicken. <laughs> 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 Which, as we're, we're up on the hour, I have to, I know the answer to this because you already told me, but I just think it's such a good story <laughs> on the biggest business, business mistake that David's ever made. Can you, can you give people that story? The, the, biggest, the biggest, the worst trade? The, the big, the, the, it's, it's uh, your, your paper route story. Back to my youth, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm often asked, I think you probably are too, like, what's the best trade you've ever done in the worst trade? Yeah. And the worst trade I can just answer instantly because I grew up with almost nothing, right? And so yeah. I had a paper route <laughs> in Boston, and it was brutal in the summer. Is it Newton? Yeah, that's yeah. where, but the wrong side of Newton. <laughs> it's pretty cushy. I was on the wrong side. Um, and uh, brutal in the summer because it's really hot and steamy, and brutal in the winter for obvious reasons. And, but I took the paper route because I just had sort of one FOMO goal in mind. Because right, I had a buddy who had the paper route before me, and he had a black and white TV, and he got to watch sports in his room without his parents knowing it. It was like five by five black and white. And it cost back in the day like 80 bucks. And he gave up his paper route in like January. So I started doing it in January. And my goal was to get to 80. We got like a penny and a half to deliver the globe. And, you know, it was hard. Uh, you know, get up 5.30 every morning for like six bucks a week, right? But I finally got to 80 bucks, and I got to 80 bucks like the first week in December. And that was it. It was drop the mic, give up the paper route. There was somebody, you don't give up a paper route in the first week in December because then the tips roll in right before Christmas. Worst trade I ever made. <laughs> What's your worst, by the way? Oh, jeez. You probably don't want to talk no, about I, I, it I, 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 in, in my book that I basically wrote with Rich Blake, yeah. at some point maybe I'll, I'll, I'll write one myself, but... Uh, I just told the story of being short Reebok, like being, the, that's when I think about trades, like the m most amount of other people's money, which you you talk a lot about and maybe we'll address here at the end, but OPM, that was the biggest OPM one day loss, mm -hmm. uh, being short Reebok, you know, um, they were being bought out and that was brutal. Just such a bad wake-up call. It was a bad wake-up call because we played golf for abandoned dunes of all things. It was one of these, you know, conferences that had the the golf component to mm -hmm. it, and we were up late, and uh, it was a late night. Plus, you're on the West Coast, mm -hmm. and my boss n on the East Coast, and that was the news at the early morning, and that was awful, because you know they, he had to get the. Um, I wasn't answering the phone <laughs> in the room, and you know the the somebody from the hotel, you know, and then I'm like. This is not good. Yeah. Yeah, it was bad. It was memorable, too. Yeah, just yeah. being a short seller is not We're, for the faint of heart. You, you mean, the mistakes that you make, and you talk a lot about this, I mean, um, you cannot be good at this unless you screw up with other people's money and yeah. or your own. Because especially if you don't, I mean, assuming you have principles, right? You, you're, you assume responsibility and recommendation, responsibility in your position, accountability, transparency. Mm. That was awful. I had never seen that amount of, I mean, I don't think my whole hometown has seen that amu the amount of money that yeah, yeah. I lost in, yeah, in, in exactly. that moment. Yeah, yeah, I can tell it still it stayed with you. Yeah. Real quickly, did you change your process as a result of the Reebok debacle? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, number one was sizing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was a big one. Uh, I, I meant your golf habits. <laughs> uh, the, and I, I just, um, every single time I've screwed up, I change something. Whether or not it's... Yeah. You know, it's not like explicit, yeah. like in the model, but there's like there's something that changes yeah. in leading up to yeah. positions or yeah. making a decision. There's something that you can yeah. always do better. Yeah, it's like watching the uh, replay. Like when I coach um, either the 12 year old kids or the 15 year old team that I coach, it's just like reviewing the tapes. Yeah. There's always somewhere on the ice where you could have made a better decision. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's what I talk about at the beginning of that talk, right? But the mistakes in our business need to be right sized. They need to be big enough so that they're painful and you'll study them and learn from them. But if they're too big, Out of there. you get the red card, right? You don't come back. Yeah. So that's which, the delicate balance. Which fortunately is why I'm sitting here today. The biggest mistake <laughs> you know, that we as a firm at Carlisle made, again, our credit guys lost all, almost all of the money. I remember you know, very so, well. So, and, and it was yeah. a high profile situation. Mm -hmm. And I, I always say, hey, look, I got fired, but I mean, it's not, it's not like the rest of the team didn't get fired. Yeah. I mean, and that, that provided, like me, the opportunity to, well, ultimately have this conversation with you, go mm -hmm. on this long journey. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, because I just didn't want to answer to anybody anymore. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, I was down like 3.6, 3.6, yeah, 3.6 percent. I mean, it's not, it's not a drawdown. You know, yeah. it's it's just a bad month going into the wrong exactly. time when the whole firm is having a really bad month. Yeah. And um, yeah, and it it you know sometimes losing it all is good in different ways. You it know? can be. Yeah, it can be. It's it's really hard to come back from. Yeah. I mean, but on a very serious note, there are a lot of people that are really suffering right now as we speak from what happened in crypto, yep. for what happened in markets outside of crypto, too. Yep. A lot of people have, you know, we both know what's happened in the last 12 months mm -hmm. in both crypto and traditional markets. And a lot of people have taken a lot of pain mm -hmm. and are which, really, really hurting. Which is why, like, um, which is why we're so focused on almost dog on a bone, like like jumping. People are like, why are you jumping on Blackstone? I like Blackstone, or they're good guys. It's like, it's not about the guys and gals at the firm. It's about all the guys and gals out there that are in B-REIT that can't get out. Yeah. You know, so I, I, it, it's just, it's not, it's, it's not for any other reason than to say, hey, look, this stuff's all happening. Whether you just lost half in your Tesla long position, like some people, they, yeah. they, they're the same investors that were long FTX, Lunacoin, Dogecoin. Elon got people to buy Dogecoin mm -hmm. that are long Tesla stock. You know, so you, you have these, this community of people that can either be helped or not. And the, the only way I, I feel like we can do our part is to be somewhat loud about it. I, I don't yeah. think we'd be accused of being quiet. And, and try to get these concentric circles in the same picture so that people understand peak of the cycle, peak leverage, on the other side equals mm -hmm. peak of the cycle, peak leverage, no liquidity. Yeah, but the philosophical basis for that, Keith, if I can say so, and I, 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 I try to check myself when I say this because it sounds like virtue signaling, mm. is you treat your work as a profession. It's also a business, but first and mm. foremost is a profession. What's the distinction between a profession and a business? You get different answers from different people. My answer is that the professionals always and everywhere put their customer or client's interests first above their own. Very simple. You, you, again, you can be a professional and run a really good, solid, profitable business, but you have to rank order everything in life. You, to your credit, rank order the signal over the quads. Mm -hmm. right? I do putting policy together, building the Eiffel Tower. I'm very careful to rank order things. Why? Because they will come into conflict. And the worst possible time to try to resolve the conflict is when the crisis is occurring, mm -hmm. right? Then you're in the OODA loop or you're sully over the Hudson and you gotta, that's not the time to figure out how do I rank order things, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta do it in advance before the crisis hits so that you can then make the right sound decision under really challenging conditions. What wonderful yeah. Yeah. advice to unfortunately <clears throat> end on because, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. being proactively prepared and having the process in place or that base, like, like I even said today on the macro show, like if today in this moment on the open is when you're not still exactly. and executing, like what was yeah. the point mm -hmm. of doing the whole thing? I mean, yeah. it's absolutely no point, right? Yeah. And it's not for everybody, yeah. but um, I sincerely appreciate this being in some way, shape or form, <laughs> you know, for you and, and like that, that is, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't overstate how much of a compliment that is. So, yeah, so, I'm, so. I'm grateful, I really am, to you and the team. Well, thank you, I'm Thanks. sure, and, and I'm sure all of you and Hedge Eye Nation are quite grateful for having this opportunity to listen to, to a great investor who's got a great process, he's got great principles too.